Hey, sorry I didn't see you there. Um, I was just looking out the window. Daydreaming. It's proper overcast today, like. Sorry, I'm doing it again. <laughs> Sometimes I just catch myself looking out the window. It was uh, raining this morning. So it's watching the raindrops down the window. I like the image of rain on the window pane. The sound, I just find it hypnotising. It's like the only image that I feel that I can really use to explain how I see things sometimes. I'm visually impaired in my left eye, you see. Um, it's what, 10 years? I cannot believe it's been 10 years. But 10, four months. That's when I had a surgery on my left eye. It was an accident. Anyway, the surgery, to spare the gory details, they injected silicon to reinflate the eyeball. So every day when I just turn my head, I get all these bubbles just floating around. I like to think it's like raindrops on a window pane when it's raining. <laughs> Ten years ago. Ten years ago, I definitely didn't have this ginger moustache like. Sorry, I haven't introduced myself, have I? Um, I'm Robin, Robin Paley York. I'm your host for this evening. Thanks for joining. Ten years ago. Yeah. Ten years ago. So, I, aeroplanes and California girls, they were in uh, number one in July 2010. Bloody hell. Katy Perry. Imagine that, eh? I um, didn't have quite short hair back then. No, this is kind of a, a number two, I'd say. It's a little bit longer due to lockdown. A little bit of a lockdown haircut, but uh, home style. Not going to the barbers, not yet. And I used to straighten my hair. So it was a little bit longer than my ears. Like an emo, like proper emo. Self-straightened and everything. It was a bit strange. We all go through that phase, don't we? <laughs> um, Auburn, just like me moustache. And I loved wearing checkered shirts, just like this one. This one is a dark blue and British racing green with a bit of white. Got this for my 16th birthday. Can't believe it still fits. Well, just. Yeah. <laughs> Ten years ago. I lived in Burley. It's a small town that sits in between Durham and Newcastle. I actually lived on that housing estate where there was the tragic killing of Christopher Brown by Raoul Thomas Mort. Aye, Raoul Mort. I'll not forget that name. The morning I rushed down, I saw the news. It was quite sunny and warm. It's a rarity for the northeast, I know. It's lovely. I now live in London, but Back in Berkeley, that was the most police action I'd ever seen in my life. There was at least 20 to 30 police vehicles, cars and vans, uh, hundreds of police officers in the estate. There was at least one helicopter there for three days. It might have been two every now and again. Just constantly whirring. It's either the news or the police. Always there. It felt like born lockdown. Do you know what I mean? Not this kind of lockdown, it was different. <laughs> anyway, enough about me. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I hope you are getting as comfy as I am, and you're joining me in my living room. Um, this is an interactive audio drama. It's not passive. You were there then, and you're here now, so I want you to get involved if you can. This is presented live. So you've all been muted. Um, you happen, if you happen to unmute yourself, don't worry, we might just re-mute you. That's just for the comfort of everybody else so that they can hear the audio drama clearly. Um, that'll be done by myself or a colleague of mine. Don't worry. Honestly, you'll get your chance to have your say. I did say this is interactive. You have to join in. Remember how we use social media? Think of it as the same. This is your time to have your say. 
you can comment. So there's a little chat option down at the bottom of uh, Zoom. If you click on that, it'll pop open a window and you can use that to join in the conversation and have your say. If you want uh, a quick little shortcut for computer users, that is Alt and H. For Mac users, that is Command, Shift and H. So join in the conversations. Um, don't forget, uh, we'll be hosting a uh, post-show Q&A after. So if you've got any questions that you don't want to use now or in a bit, then feel free to use them in the question and answers. There's no pressure either. If nothing comes, nothing comes. But do get involved if you can. Um, your messages will be sent just to me, so nobody else will be able to see them. So don't worry if you're a little bit nervous or shy. Uh, yeah, it's just to me. I don't have to read them out if you don't want. You can just let us know. And uh, what I want to say beforehand is I want to ask you, how has your lockdown been? Really, how have you felt? Have you felt at times that you've been a little bit trapped? Like you just want to break free? Like you want to go to Barnard Castle in Durham just to test your eyesight? Well, send me your thoughts in the comments. How you found lockdown. Is everybody ready? You're sitting comfortably. I'd like to hand over to Matthew. 2010 saw one of the biggest manhunts in British police history. It took place in and around Newcastle, a proud and tough shipbuilding city in the northeast of England. The hunt was for just one man, Raoul Thomas Moat. Because I am hunting for officers right now. Did he just say he's been shot? I know. Of course. But a man who fits the description no, of Raoul Thomas Moat. I'm a police officer. Find out where David is on his sat now. You're going to have to kill me because I am never going to stop. The northeast of England isn't famed for its summer weather, but at 11 a.m. on Thursday the 2nd of July 2010, it promised to be a fine day. That was the moment Raoul Mote was released from Durham prison. Eight days later, he will be dead, but not before he'd become the biggest event on TV news. Mote had spent the previous five weeks in prison for an incident of domestic violence. He'd thrown a chair at his partner, Sam Stobart, which had hit their daughter. At that moment, their five-year relationship comes to an end. In prison, Moat sleeps little more than an hour or two a night. He's worked the door at various nightclubs. He's a big man. Physical exercise helps him let off steam and gives him a sense of control. In a small prison cell, he quickly deteriorates. The night after his release, Moat is crouched in the garden of his ex-girlfriend's mother's house. At 2.39 a.m., Samantha Stobart, his ex, leaves the house. She's accompanied by her new boyfriend, Chris Brown. At 2.40 a.m., Moat stands up from the bushes and shoots twice. He reloads and fires again, and the third shot kills Chris Brown. Moat turns the gun towards Sam and fires. He has something special for her. Cartridges he's doctored himself to reduce their explosive force. He doesn't want to kill her. He wants to injure her enough so she will get compensation. Enough to look after his daughter. Moat is not planning to live the week. Moat is driven by two accomplices to a four-man tent hidden in woods near Rothbury, a small rural town north of Newcastle. It is 6 a.m. He sleeps. Fifteen miles away, Police Constable David Rathband has a 7am appointment with the golf course. He has a tournament that weekend and there's £28 of prize money to be won. At three o'clock that afternoon, he goes to Ethel Road Police Station. He logs onto the work computer to find the latest on the moat situation. He knows moat. He'd arrested him once for suspected scrap metal theft. At 4.50 p.m., 
a hoax call sends him to a pub car park in Newburn. There is no sign of Moat. At eight o'clock, he goes back to the station for dinner. At 9.30, he calls his wife, Kath, to check on his daughter's birthday party. He can hear the breathless fun and screams in the background. At 10.40 p.m., Rathband returns to the spot that he thinks will give him most chance of catching Moat. It's 11 o'clock. Ral Moat is in a car ringing 999. You're not trying to help me. You're not trying. You're wanting me to do myself in, and I was going to do it until I found out about him properly and what was going on. And as soon as I found out he was one of your officers, I thought, nah, you've too much from me. You, you've had too much from me. You'll get the chance to kill me, right? You'll get the chance to kill me. I don't want to do that. I do, I do not want to do that. Yes, you do. You're wanting me to kill myself, but I'm going to give you a chance because I am putting for officers right now. Just a few minutes later, Raoul Moat crawls on his hands and knees until he nears the back of PC Rathband's car. We hear the sound of cars whooshing past. We hear the sound of a gun tip-tapping on a car window. We hear one shot, and then a few seconds later, another. This is PC David Rathband's story. Can you see any light or dark? No. You okay, Kath? Right here. But you're okay. I'm not going anywhere. Come back tomorrow. I want to have a look at that left eye. Every time I fall asleep, he comes. But he, he, he comes in skeletons. Not like the ones in the Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm seeing things, Cathy. He won't stop. Shh, baby. I don't feel very well. I'm a policeman and I don't, I don't feel very well. No, you're not very well. The police need a statement. Can you do that? Yeah, yes, yes, I can do that, yeah. You OK, Kath? I'm not going anywhere. Can I ask you? I... I... I am police constable. David Rathband. I'm a police officer in the Northumbrian Constabulary at... He's dead. Towards the end of my shift, at 11 p.m., I left the A1 West Road and parked up on the drop curb at, at the edge of the pavement at the top of the slip road. Oh, God! Oh, God! Hi. I'm Police Constable David Rathband. I'm an officer. Oh, I am not. The Northumbrian Constabulary at East Denton. <sighs> Social networks only really exist when people turn up. It's a virtual thing. Think of a portal like MSN or Yahoo, and it really makes no difference to you whether there's a hundred people on there or a hundred million people on there. But with a social network, say Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat, if there's a hundred people on there, it's terrible. There's nothing on it. But if there's a hundred million people on there, then it's really good. And so all of these things get better the more people use them. Raoul Mort, Friday, 2.23pm, July 2nd, 2010, Facebook update. Just got out of jail. I've lost everything. My business, my property, and to top it all off, my last six years has gone off with someone else. I'm not 21, and I can't rebuild my life. Watch and see what happens. Tommy Edison, blind film critic and YouTube star. Today... I want to show you how the iPhone works. A lot of you guys have been asking, you're blind. I see you using an iPhone, but how does it work for you? Well, I'm going to show you. So 
A lot of devices have this thing that you've probably never even thought to use or check out. It's called accessibility. Click accessibility button. That'll show you all the different sort of things. How to turn the speech on and off of your phone to white on black, black on white, maybe mono audio. There's all sorts of different things you can do. So, um, oh, I just use the voiceover one and it works incredible. Click voiceover on button. But, but it's a very cool thing and it allows me to use this, this thing that has a touch screen just like you do. Slide or double tap click. So each thing. Double tap to open. Touch it once, it tells you what it is, twice to perform the action. No, map, stop, YouTube. And then to move to the different screens, three fingers to go left, like this. So let's see what's going on in the world of Twitter today. Bleep. A dad kit louse, inventor of Siri. Siri's really just the beginning, uh, even for Siri. What we've got today is just scratching the surface. Uh, in fact, one of the jokes that we had when we were putting together a roadmap, so with each release you kind of name the software, one of the first things we called it was periodically human. It's kind of a tagline, Siri, periodically human. And then a little bit later, it gets a little bit better and becomes practically human. And then the next one after that becomes positively human. In a way, people know how to use social media from celebrities. And the problem was that then after that, it was kill all humans. And what a lot of celebrities do is they issue statements. But I think the big thing Facebook did was introduce real life or encourage people to use real identities. In the days before Facebook, when it was Bebo, when it was MySpace or whatever, people would call themselves, you know, Snoopy247. There was a classic New Yorker cartoon which had a dog with a keyboard saying, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. But what Facebook encouraged was for people to say, this is who I am, be guilt-free about what they were doing. The day David was shot, I was going through my third bout of chronic anxiety. I was 38. I thought I'd put all the pain of a catastrophic childhood behind me, and then suddenly, in a business meeting, the fear came. Not normal fear. This was special fear. This was never-ending terror. Try running a business meeting when you're scared that you've wet yourself and you have to keep checking that you haven't. Try looking at your son, knowing you aren't the same person you were the day before. Try playing with them when the whole world feels like it's reflected in the back of a spoon. Over the next few days, I kept pressing the brakes. I, I used every mantra that had got me through the last episode. I kept slamming my foot onto the floor. I kept trying to find the brakes and nothing happened. In the end, I put my hands over my face and closed my eyes and braced for impact and kept them there. What else was there to do? I told no one at work. Slowly, every project I was involved with fell apart. Soon, everything I did triggered panic. If I slept at all, my brain would wake me up specifically to have another fit of fear and horror. Night after night after night. Only my wife knows the truth of it. And even I didn't share with her how much I wanted to die. I couldn't make any sense of it. And as I lay there, next to my wife, I would turn on my phone and go to forum after forum, trying to understand. That's when I first heard David's voice. I clicked on an interview, and there he was in the dark. It seemed like he was saying, you're not alone, mate. We'll get through this somehow. We'll get through it somehow. Hello there, this is the gunman from Berkeley last night. Uh, my name is Raoul Mort. What I'm phoning about is, is to tell you exactly why I've done what I've done, right? Now, my girlfriend has been having an affair behind my back with one of your officers, right? Now, I... You bastards have been onto me, right, for years. You have hassled us, harassed us, you just won't leave us alone. I went straight six years ago when I met her, and I've tried my best to have a normal life, and you just won't let up. You just won't leave us alone for five minutes. I can't walk down the street without the blue lights flashing. You have stitched us up for years. I'm 
I've been shot. Did you just say he's been shot? Find out where David is on his sat nav. Do a GPS on him. I can see my son. Son? Why are you here, Ash? Am I dead? Yeah, I'm on the A1 roundabout at the junction of the A69, Stamfordham Road. Are you taking me serious now? I have just downed your officer. You're going to have to kill me because I am never going to stop. The public has nothing to fear from me, but the police do. Temporary Chief Constable Sue Sim, David, I need you to hear me, David. We are going to get the person who did this to you. Do you understand? PC David Rathband underwent surgery last night and remains critical but stable. Our thoughts remain with the family and friends of those who have been killed and injured at this difficult time. We remain absolutely committed to finding Raoul Thomas Moe and are using every resource available to bring this to a conclusion as quickly as possible. Chris Stobart, father to Moat's first victim, Sam Stobart, and father figure to Moat. Raoul, son, please, this has to stop. It's gone on far too long. What sort of memories will these kids have of their father? If they ask me in the future, I'll tell them exactly what happened. I won't lie to them, you, you know that. I don't have to tell them what might upset them about you or, or whatever's gone on. How are you, son? Give it up. Josephine Keeley, Raoul Mort's mother. This man does not look like my son. I feel he hasn't been my son since he was 19 years old. He now has a totally different character, attitude and manner. And now, when I see him, I don't recognise him at all. He would be better off dead. If I was to make an appeal, I would say he would be better off dead. For every piece of inaccurate information published, I will select a member of the public and kill them. Putting it bluntly, this is a potential life and death situation. The information that we have from Mr. Moe is that he is upset by some of the press reporting. Unfortunately, we do not know exactly what he objects to. The reporting itself may be inaccurate. We are talking about his perception. We've taken advice from a forensic psychologist. It's clear that Mr. Moat's rules have changed and that he is getting angrier. Extract from Mum's Net, 8th July. Spider Mama. I know I shouldn't be flippant about this. And I know it shouldn't be important, blah, blah. But have you seen the barnet on that policewoman who talked to the press conference about the hunt for Raoul Moat? <gasps> I swear my jaw dropped. I've never seen anything like it. Chief Constable Sue Sim, she's called. Meet her, not Twitter. Agreed. Hideous hair. Mugglewump. There's a thread on this in Style and Beauty, but yes, I agree. It's truly shocking. Almost like three separate hair pieces stuck on. Puzzle rocks. I feel guilty for even thinking it, but it really is remarkable. I think you'll find that that is, in fact, where Mr. Moat is hiding. Pauline Jones. Her special eyeshadow for the press conference is a work of art, too. Think her muse as Mrs. Slocum. Bran, is there a link? I'm curious just to see how bad it is. Mugglebump. Yes, uh, Puzzle Rocks has it. I'm going to phone and report it now and claim the £10,000 reward for myself. Big green bin. Piss myself laughing. That moat is hiding in there. I'm sure she's a very competent police officer, though, which is what counts when there's a gunman on the loose. But still, the hair. Pauline Jones, when they go on the TV like this, do they have some makeup person faffing over them? Bran, they should surely be sacked for the hair. And that's for the eyeshadow. Sweet Judy Blue. Poo face alert. I can laugh at most things, but this is a bit much. The poor woman didn't ask to be thrust into the spotlight and she's hardly got time to be going for a makeover. She must be under so much stress without being ridiculed. We should be supporting her for doing so well in what must be one of the worst environments for a woman to work in. Or maybe that should be poor face. Bran, you're right, sweet Judy Blue. And it's not as though senior male police officers always look dapper. But you never see any threats about appalling comb overs. But still, the hair. And it would look okay ish if she tied the long bit back into a bun or something. And only you can know if you're poo faced or poo faced, sweet Judy Blue. 
If you're potty training a small child at the moment, as I am, then you may very well have poo on your face. I'm no Derek Bird. I won't shoot no ladies in their bubble hats. Are you safe, Kat? Yes, David, I'm safe. And Mia and Ashley, are they safe? We're all safe, David. Shh. I'm glad you're safe. Yeah, it won't be long now, David. It'll soon be over. The TV survival expert, Ray Mears, was drafted in by police to hunt down Raoul Moat. It emerged yesterday. Mears, 46, was asked to assist armed officers as they close in on the fugitive during the seven-day manhunt. He is believed to be helping track Moat's movements after the gunman fled his makeshift camp in the Northumberland countryside. Mears, best known for his BBC series on survival techniques, has refused to comment. Constable Sue Pert. Two little girls came into the police station just last night and they handed me this card. It's addressed to all of the police force. I'd like to read what it says. To everyone that's trying to get this nutter off the streets, we would like to say thank you very much for putting yours in danger to save ours. Police have apologised to the public after a gaffe during a press conference on their search for fugitive Raoul Mode. The incident occurred when neighbourhood inspector Sue Pert showed a goodwill card from local children to police officers and reporters during a live broadcast. The apology was in reference to the use of the term nutter with regards to Mr Moat. And we're just getting breaking news that a man who fits the description of Raoul Thomas Moat has been located in the Raoul Riverbank Thomas area in the vicinity of Rockbury. Police are currently negotiating. Soon, David. You'll be safe soon. Shh. David. I remember that night as the night that Twitter exploded and came of age in the UK. Until then, the UK response to Twitter was just to make stupid jokes. And then, and then all of a sudden, shit, Gaza's trending. What's going on? And, and Gaza had turned up. It was like the best entertainment because everyone was talking amongst themselves in a Viz magazine way on Twitter. G Gaza? Whereas on TV they would be saying, we understand that Paul Gascoigne has arrived, but on TV they couldn't just say, bloody hell, Gaza! G Gaza? But everybody else in the world was, bloody hell, Gaza! Gaza! It was just like this. Oh, 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 oh good evening. Uh, you're live on Real Radio. Um, I, I just wonder, um, Gaza, if you can tell us about the Raoul Moore, the, the, the Raoul Moore that you know. Raoul, 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 uh, Raoul I, I knew him years, years ago. He, he used to be a bouncer in Newcastle. I, you know, I, I knew him a lot of years since I was a young kid when, when, I, when I played for Newcastle. He, he was a gentleman, you know, so, so someone must have wound him up or, or, or done or done something and, and all, all of a sudden, I, I, you know, I just listened to the radio, right, and I, and I mean on, on TV news and oh, oh, obviously he's killed someone and, he, and he's shot too, right? Well, I, I think... Doesn't matter, doesn't matter, he's, he's killed someone, which is, which is not nice really, and oh, oh, obviously he, he, he must have been on drugs um, and he's shot two people. Right? Now, I, I've heard on the news that obviously the drugs must wore off now and he's willing to give in. Right? Well, I, well, I, th I think we need to point out that... No, um, no, that... Wait, no let us get, get old. No, hear me out, right? Uh, he, he's a lovely bloke and I know that. So, uh, at the end of the day, I think he's fighting in case, uh, you know, he's, he's put his gun down and I know for a fact he, he will. He put his gun down but I think he's scared in case police shoot him and kill him, you know, and the drugs are worn off and all, all he wants to do is surrender and at the, at the, end, of, at the end of the day when, when you shoot someone, I think, and you and you shoot, like, kill someone and you shoot two others, you, you may get, what is it, 12 days, 12 years, like, 12... No, Paul, 12 Paul, years, Paul, 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 well, 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 we don't know about that exactly, but, but just tell us, well, I mean, like, what, 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 what would you, what would 12, you say 12, to... 12 years, I, it could be out six years and he's out, you know, he's a good lad. You know, like, if, 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 if he could hear a message from you, Gaza, uh, what, what would you say to him tonight? Right, listen, I, I, I drove from Newcastle in a taxi to Rothbury, you know, cost a lot of money, and I, and I, I bought a dressing gown for him, a, a big jacket, and I bought 
some chicken, and some bread, and I, I know you, you're gonna laugh at this one. I, I bought him a can of lager, and I, I bought I bought him a fishing rod because I heard he's by the river. And I, I, I brought him a fishing rod too. You know, let's we fish together, and and I'll have a chat with him and just talk. You know, because I I, th I think I can I think I can I, I can help him through this. I I think I'm the only one. Morning. You're watching Sky News with live coverage of the standoff between the fugitive Raoul Moat and armed police officers. The man called Britain's Most Wanted is surrounded by these ten snipers in the riverside area of Rothbury in Northumberland. Witnesses say he is holding a sawn-off shotgun to his head, sometimes to his throat. These are the latest pictures. We assume this is an ambulance, the blues and twos of the police vehicle in front. That ambulance has Raoul Moat in it. Until around about 25 minutes ago, he was Britain's most wanted man. There has been at least one shot that happened about 25 minutes ago. He has now been taken in a police convoy to a Newcastle hospital. Is it over, Kath? You okay, Kath? I'm not going anywhere. Can I ask you? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... I... I am police constable. David Rathbunt. I'm a police officer in the Northumbrian Constabulary at East Dent. Towards the end of my shift, at 11 p.m., I left the A1 West Road and parked up on the drop curb at the edge of the pavement at the top of the slip road. Oh, God! Oh, God! Hi. I am Police Constable David Rathband. I'm an officer. I'm an officer in the Northumbrian Constabulary at East Denton. East Denton. I'm a policeman and, and I don't feel very well. Oh, God. I... I cannot believe I completely forgot about Gaza. That... that bit was just a little bit surreal. We laughed. I remember we were having a family barbecue wall outside and when Gaza came on we ran inside and we started watching the telly. It was really strange. I really remember the chicken, the dressing gown, the six pack of beers, it wasn't just one, and uh, the fishing rod, that really stood out. In hindsight we shouldn't have laughed. Three people had been shot, right? One person died. A police officer had been blinded. A little bit like me. Why was it funny? Gaza obviously wasn't in a good place. I don't know. It was a similar time, I suppose, ten years ago. When we could laugh about celebrities. Celebrities would cover the telly, they'd be all over the newspapers and magazines. And there were like animals living in a zoo, do you know what I mean? Now it's changed there, I suppose. But at least celebrities were seen more as clowns rather than... Well, they definitely weren't seen as politicians anyway, were they? So, I did say this is interactive. It is a, a three-act play. And they're roughly about half an hour. We're going to use these intervals, though, as moments to reflect on your comments. So let's have a look about how you found lockdown. So I'm just going to go to our first comment. Thank you very much for sending them through. Do feel free to keep sending them. Um, my first one was from Kieran. Thank you, Kieran. At times trapped, at times fun. Enjoy the gin and the recognition, uh, the rec recognition um, of what is important. Yeah, that's a nice one. Uh, from Caroline, I found lockdown an opportunity to breathe a little more than normal. Yeah, it has been a time for peace and just resting a little bit, hasn't it? From Annette, 
Hi Robin, my lockdown has been really great, all the best. I'm glad to hear it. And from um, the next one, uh, Chris, loving it. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, do feel free to send um, thoughts and comments as well. From Maria, um, lockdown for a lot of disabled people has not been anything out of the ordinary. Um, it's the sudden loss of liberty for people not aware of this experience that made them feel like they had cabin fever and want to break out. Not sure whether this ties into David's experience of sudden sight loss. That is a really great perspective and something that I hadn't really taken into account. Thank you for that. A uh, comment from Vicky. Um, what an incredible uh, piece of work. Exciting. Feels live. It's gripping. Loving it. Thank you. Oh, lush. Glad to hear it, Vicky. And there was a one here from Bethan earlier. Um, I found I've been on social media more during lockdown in the need of trying to find something to fill in the hours. Yeah, I've definitely been on Twitter just scrolling, sometimes for news and sometimes just to pass the time. Um, one from Joanna. My mum and dad are remembering being in a and b on holiday that week and not being sure what was going on. Oh, that's interesting. They know exactly where they were. It's always strange. You do tend to remember where you are for a specific event. We all know, don't we, sometimes? Uh, Suzanne, I found it a chance to paint and decorate my, my tatty flat. Oh, I hope it's a little less tatty for you. Uh, from Amy, liberated and able to do lots more stuff. Less FOMO, less fear of missing out. Lush. And uh, from Amelia and Alm, my lockdown has been, well, I started taking beta blockers. Feel free to fill in the rest. Yeah, I can imagine it has been tough on a lot of people. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, it is something that we do sometimes struggle with, especially in relation to social media and mental health as well. The lockdown's been really tough for a lot of us. Um, Colin, enjoyed the first few weeks of the lockdown with no traffic and lots of birdsong. Yeah, it's faded a little bit now, hasn't it? Um, and I, sorry, forgive me. This is where visual impairment and reading a screen live is a little bit more tricky than normal. Uh, the text is quite small. Um, Joanna, in lockdown, enjoying sunshine, uh, enjoying spring happen day by day and really taking notice for the first time. Suzanne, as a reclusive person, I was pleased for others to experience, uh, ooh, to experience being alone. Um, and a comment from Hannah. Good point, Maria. I've enjoyed watching my sighted colleagues struggling with communicating via audio. Yeah, there's something interesting we have in this um, very visual world. Absolutely. Um, some of us sighted people kind of forget about that. Um, yeah. Oh, going back to Joanna. They were actually in the B&B &B in Rothbury at the time. Okay. That is something that you cannot forget when you are physically locked down in the town, in the village of Rothbury. Wow, that must have been quite difficult, maybe. Stressful. Um, yeah. Um, I've got a couple more. Loving this, but also got technology ache. Technology ache. Oh, yeah, I feel you. Um, as a sighted visually impaired per person, like I really struggle looking at screens like every day. Um, and from Stephen, one heck of a learning curve, practically and emotionally. Yeah, keep rolling, uh, riding that roller coaster. We're getting there. We're nearly there, I promise. Um, I'm going to take a pause on comments for now, but do keep them coming. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to them in the next interval. Um, for some, it is better if uh, you have earphones or headphones. It's probably the best audio um, experience that you have. I appreciate others. You are in groups, so that might be a little bit difficult. Um, yeah. Uh, so, 10 years ago, uh, social media, stuff like this, commenting, it wasn't really there. We heard in the first act that it was just starting to pick up. It was on the rise. I didn't use Twitter back then. I used to use Facebook. I hadn't had a Twitter account, I don't think, not back then. But I used Facebook every day, pretty much. Um, but it's quite banal. Uh, I was a whiny teenager. I did quizzes. 
and I posted stupid pictures um, all the time. I don't think anybody really appreciated the power of Facebook. Um, like it was before the time of uh, Cambridge Analytica, before they got caught. It was before Russian bots and it was before the Arab Spring where we saw the power in a huge community and communities in different countries as well. Um, how did you use social media? That's one thing I want to find out. So send me your thoughts and your comments in the chat. And um, that is Alt H for PC users and Command Shift N H for Mac users. How did you use Facebook and Twitter back then? Did you say anything about Raoul Mort or Rothbury or PC Rathband? What kind of things would you say if you didn't? How do you feel about it now? That's one of my over in the next act. Um, one thing I also am thinking about is how is this for PC Rathband? Social media was really picking up, but access tools for visually impaired people weren't what they are today. They're not as good as today's smartphones or um, screen readers. I wonder how much David Rathband could access online and what that did to him during his time of adjusting to his blindness. Anyway, that's enough from me. Keep your comments coming through. Over to Matthew. Two thousand and ten saw one of the biggest manhunts in British police history. It took place in and around Newcastle, a proud and tough shipbuilding city in the northeast of England. The hunt was for just one man, Raoul Thomas Moat. But this isn't his story. This is a story about the traffic policeman he shot and blinded, Police Constable David Rathband. After three operations and nearly two weeks in hospital, he was able, with his wife Kath's help, to move around the ward. Are you sat on the stool? Yeah, yeah. Good. My left eye is completely bloodshot and my right eye has been sewn up. I can smell the stench of blood. For 13 days I have smelt nothing but blood. It's my first shower. I don't need to sit on a stool to have a shower. Are you okay? Yes. Do you need a towel? <clears throat> to get rid of the smell, I rub the soap into my eyes and sting them senseless. I don't care. The hot water rushes over me, and for a moment I forget. For a second, I'm simply in the shower, just like everyone else who is simply in the shower with their eyes closed. <sighs> then I remember. Imagine blindfolding yourself and walking into a room full of razor blades and having to negotiate them by feeling. This is what I face. Nothing frightens me more. I feel like I'm facing a marathon. It takes me 15 minutes to reach the end of the corridor. I'm not terrified of the darkness because I, I can still see lights here and here, I have simple patterns, I have straight lines, and sometimes detailed pictures of buildings, and sometimes it is just white light, like the sun shining on a frozen lake on a beautiful winter's day. Does anyone know where I could get a round moat t-shirt? eBay won't allow the sale of them. I like them. It says here we can use bump-ons. We stick them on things. Why? Well, this is so we don't get lost in the kitchen. How the hell can you get lost in your own kitchen? We can also use a pen friend. This will help us attach and read audio labels. Who is paying for all of this? David. Yeah? We can worry about that later. No, really, I mean, 
How much do this watch cost? But it doesn't matter how much it cost. I want to sleep now. Are you sure you don't want to push through? It's only 5.30. I need to sleep. Okay. Have you tried www.raumotshirt.com? My item arrived in just two days and it's excellent quality and was beautifully packaged. This happens every night. Moat even gets through to the dark place that morphine takes you to. Facebook page RIP Raoul Moat died age 37, but for many you only live for seven days. I refuse to delete this page as it is just an RIP page like any other. The government can't delete it either. End of RIP. It's a shame there's no afterlife or a piece of trash like him could suffer. The reality is his pain is gone. His demons are no more. They lay still like his rotten corpse, and like those who suffered at his hands and continue to do so. Nearly 20,000 likes, R.I.P. Ralmo. I'm loving this page. That's brilliant. I could spend all day laughing at the chavs who most probably didn't even know him proclaiming their undying love for a murdering, raping monster. The spelling is good too. Quality. Keep it up. R.I.P. Ralm. I hope you haunt all the sick, sad people who are bad-mouthing you. For God's sake, the man is dead. Now this is a page of respect, and we don't want all you sick haters on here. Do us all a favour and get back to the hating page where you can all agree and leave us alone to say what we want to say. Rest in peace, Ralph. Kiss, kiss, kiss. The time is more o'clock. The time is more o'clock. The time is more o'clock. And here I stay until 5am. Till I fall asleep, utterly exhausted. Then one morning in hospital, I wake up. I'm scared. Shh, David, it's early. Please wake up. I'm asleep. It's all black. Please, wake up. What time is it? I'm here. Thank you. What's happening? The lights have gone. Everything's all black in my head. Uh, isn't that normal? No. This is different. It was light before, and now it's dark. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to call a doctor? No, no. Oh, Christ, what time is it? I, I, I don't know. I, I, tomorrow. <laughs> God. Please help me, Kath. Please help me. Please, please help oh, me. What, what, what do you want me to do? I don't know. Come here. I need to shut this down. Now, the kids are coming today. No, no. I can't take them. Not, not like this. I'm their dad. Yeah, that's why you must see them. Oh, God, Kath. Help me shut this down. Come on. Get up. If he comes again, you won't be here. There's a garden on the roof, and we can go up before the hospital wakes up. Just you and me. And we can hold this together, you and me. It's what we do. It's never going to be morning again, is it, Kath? It's never going to change. Of course it is. If nothing changes, then nothing... Nothing would grow. Come here. Yeah. They're going to let us home in a few days. You're doing really well. Yeah. And, and honey and spice miss you. <laughs> I've forgotten about the dogs. <laughs> oh, well, they haven't forgotten about you. Uh, oh. oh. Do, do you want to cry? Can you touch my eyes? Just put your palms over my eyes here. It's numb there, but I, I can feel the warmth here. Do you think that means that this eye is going to work again? Do you think so, Kath? I don't know, David, love. I don't think it will work again. Kath... I haven't got any eyes. I know, baby, I know. Shh. They mustn't know about this. You. The kids. No. No, th this is for us. Now, come on. Get up. Get your dressing gown on. We're going upstairs. Yes. We can't. Shh. Get up. Put this on. Come on. This way. This way.
I can feel the sun. Reach out. There, there's a cherry blossom tree. <laughs> can you say something? Do you want to say something? Oh. Oh. No, go on. Um. Oh. I, David Rathband, I am blind. I, Kath Rathband, I am blind. I am David Rathband. I am blind, and I shut this down. I close the box. I am Kath Rathband, and I am blind, and I shut this down. I close the box. will be better when we're home. Chris Heaton Harris MP. Will the Prime Minister consider having another conference call with Mark Zuckerberg, yeah, co-founder yeah, of yeah, Facebook, yeah, yeah. whose yeah. site is currently hosting yeah. on RIP Raoul Mode, where a whole host of anti-police statements are posted. And can the Prime Minister have a conversation with Mark Zuckerberg about removing this room? Yes. My, my honourable friend makes a very good point. Uh, as far as I can see, it is absolutely clear that Raoul Mote was a callous murderer. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. End of story. And I cannot understand any wave, however small, of public sympathy for this man. There should be sympathy for his victims and for the havoc he wreaked in that community. There should be no sympathy for him. Facebook is a place where people can express their views and discuss things in an open way as they can and do in many other places. And as such, we sometimes find people discussing topics others may find distasteful. However, that is not a reason in itself to stop a debate from happening. We have 26 million people on Facebook in the UK, each of which has their own opinion. And they are entitled to express their views on Facebook as long as their comments do not violate our terms. It's the day I leave hospital. I have no idea how big this is. It's huge. Someone's tipped off the tabloids, and there are paparazzi at every exit. I just want to walk into my house unassisted. I just want to walk into my kitchen in my house and see my kids. Suddenly, I feel the rush of the fresh air. I'm outside. Kath and another nurse tip me out of the wheelchair and drag me the three or four feet to the car. We flee at speed. Kath drives. I normally drive, but... I can't. I follow every inch of that journey. I feel each manhole and I know each junction. Kath tells me where I am, but I already know, I just know. Then the engine stops. There are two massive satellite trucks either side of our house. There were reporters and our drive as we pull in. Kath is furious. All I could think of was that I would never drive a car again. Get off our drive! Just leave us alone! Who the hell are you people? I stumbled out of the car and up the drive like a drunk. God, we were naive. Yeah, we soon worked out what they wanted. We hired a photographer, our own one. But they weren't interested in that. They preferred a telephoto lens. They want to see his face. A clear, unobstructed picture of my husband's beautiful face. They want to see where the pellets went in. They want to see where my eyes once were. Where the jelly slid down my cheek. They want to see blood coming down onto my chin. 
You can see the picture if you like. Just Google it. We didn't put those pictures there. When I'm in, the doorbell rings again and again and again and again. The phone doesn't stop ringing. Endless photographer's business cards being pushed through the letterbox. It, it's like the beginning of Harry Potter. My son now has a new character. He has become my guardian. He helps me round. And when I sit on the sofa, my daughter curls up next to me. We close all the curtains. And we try and live. We have to sell our story. There's no choice, you see. When I see him upset, um, you know it's just... Uh, it's heartbreaking for yourself because there's nothing really you can do. It's just a situation that you've been put in and you've just got to find a way around it. I am angry, yeah. I, I'm really angry. I'm really angry that he's been robbed, you know, because, you know, he's a really good person and he didn't deserve it. Um, <clears throat> this one is just addressed to PC Rathband in Newcastle. David, wishing you all the best for a speedy recovery. Tom, oh, he's in the Royal Canadian Mountain Police. <laughs> oh, another one from Canada. Um, keep your chin up and spirits, my brother in blue. You're a true guardian, never forget that. You have a friend in Canada pulling for you 100%. Be well soon. This one says, uh, Dear David and family, your story touched the hearts of decent folk everywhere the world over. As an expat now, living in America, may I extend my best wishes to you and your family. The British Bobbies are the finest in the world. Good luck. It's a nice one that, isn't it, David? Yeah. Is that quick? That's quick, right? It, it's in it's in front of you. I know where it is, Kath. I'm not a deaf aid. The ones at work take an age. It's because they spend all their money on flash cars. Yeah, you're not wrong. What do I do now? But put your fingers here. Right. What, what, what do you want to do? I want to send an email to the nurses at the RVI to thank them. I said that. Right. Uh, command function five. Welcome to voice over. Hello. Voiceover speaks descriptions of items on the screen, and she's a bit eager. Your computer, what should I do now? Press, press, press the space bar. Yeah. During this quick start, when you need to enter voiceover command, you will hear something like press the right, right arrow, which means press the and hold, press and hold. Control and option. The control and up right arrow. The control and up keys. Next then press the right arrow. Now continue Just to the next panel by pressing the right arrow. I just want to send an email. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to help you do that. Sh shall I give it a go? No, I'll do it. There's the tea. It's very hot. Be careful. There's a teaspoon in the cup. Can you not put it next to the 1500 quid laptop? Fine, I'll put it over here. So. When I mouse over it, it says what it is. Mm -hmm. The mouse pad is the smooth bit, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> screwed me. He has totally... He has totally screwed David. me. Not in front of the kids. Shut it down. This is not how we do things. Not here, and not now, and not ever. I just want to send an email to say thank you. I don't care, David. This is what it is. I try and keep some things quite private from my wife, because I don't think it's fair to burden her with all of my inner thoughts. But for 12 hours of the day, if I'm lucky, I'm... I consider myself to be sighted, because I'm asleep. Then, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I see is darkness, and it's not very nice, but again, I either pull my socks up and get on with the day, or I shrink and sit in front of the television or listen to the radio. 
I'm not prepared to do that. I followed David on Twitter. Lots of people did. David allowed his followers to get right inside his experience with him. David's recovery was my recovery. It was the recovery of men in trouble all over the world. In 2010, no one really understood how to use Twitter. The difference between an hashtag and an at handle. Consequently, many private conversations are there forever, accessible by a simple search. It is from these fragments that this story has been made, from public-private inner thoughts. You know, most simply, uh, the kinds of stories we're used to um, since Aristotle's day forward is that, you know, a character that we identify with, who's maybe a little bit more heroic and capable than ourselves, faces a series of challenges until they get to a place where there's a real reckoning. And at that point, things that we knew about the character from the very beginning, all of a sudden make absolute sense in terms of where they've gotten. They, they go and they, they make a final choice, a final climactic choice, which seems unexpected to us in the moment, but once they make it, we realize, oh, that's the only thing that this character could have done given who we know that character to be. Douglas Rushkoff, professor of media theory, Queens College, City University of New York. So we sort of go from, from a, a state of interest to excitement to terror, climax, can't take it anymore until that character makes the, the all-important decision which then releases us from all that anxiety. You know, so it's crisis, climax, and sleep, or what I've called the male orgasm curve of narrative. And everything we've done, uh, all of our social constructs and institutions and religions and economies and businesses and plans and wars are based on that same structure of follow me up this hill, the ends will justify the means, if you keep your eyes on the prize, we'll get there, and yay. And what, what's happened to us now is we've realized that while that structure has been really good for motivating us into war and getting us to do terrible things or making us believe in an economy, that the payoff never really happens. Life doesn't really work this way. You know, you don't get to heaven. You don't get your retirement plan. We win the war, but everybody's still suffering. There's just, it doesn't work. And as we look in the world around us, the problems we have don't seem like things that we could, like Nazis, that we could just go and beat and win and yay. They seem much more chronic and ongoing, like terrorism and pollution and depression. These are all kind of not solvable, but they're uh, problems that you kind of learn to maintain, right? That you've got to get to some sort of a, 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 a steady state where we keep these things in control, like athlete's foot fungus. You don't cure it, you know? You just keep it at bay. How do I look? Come here and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you look beautiful. Yeah, and you need a shower. Oh, it was brilliant, Kat. Oh, what? This. What's that? That's a birdie onto the 16th. <laughs> and the ability to be an utter and complete... Idiot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that bit of he's been back for about a week. Now, get in that shower. We've got to be there at 8 o'clock. 6 or 7 p.m. Duncan tried to carry me bags, but I wasn't having any of it. Is that Dragon's Den star Duncan Bannatyne you're talking about? <laughs> Yes, it is. Duncan Bannatyne, patron of my charity, the Blue Lamp Foundation. Now, I just had to check, because you hadn't mentioned him for about five minutes. I thought it might be another Duncan Bannatyne. Get in the shower, or I'm sitting on another table. I said to him, I'm carrying my own bags, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, I think he's going to be a proper maid. Yeah. I'll, I'll help you with your bow tie. Coffee, local celebrity and BBC Time Tees radio presenter. <laughs> Can we welcome David Rathman to the stage, please? Thank you, David. David, 
What was the highlight of the day? Highlight of the day, because it's a pretty exhausting day, it's just a wind down time for you now, but highlight of the day, what would it be? Um, highlight of my day is my daughter's birthday. Oh. <laughs> Coming up on stage in such a beautiful dress, and of course, having my wife and my son there. I don't feel anything for moat. I thought in time I would get angry, bitter, and all of the negative thoughts towards him. I watched his father on the telly saying that it was because he had been disowned or, you know, abandoned as a child. And at one point, I found myself feeling quite sorry for him. But then somebody mentioned that they hadn't had a father from when they were a child and they hadn't decided to go out and try and kill three people and successfully, obviously, kill one. And that just quickly, that thought left me. And, and of course, the money raised tonight going to a great cause. Tell people who are not so far aware of your organisation, tell us all about it and your charity. OK, um, it was set up as a result of what happened to me. Um, you know, my wife and I had um, hospital TV to pay for, car parking. Um, and you know, my brother has flown from Australia. Yes. My mother-in-law had to come from Spain. And, uh, and th th there's a massive amount of financial stress put on someone when they're injured, uh, criminally injured, whilst they're looking after people. You know, ambulance, yes. fire and police. And it's all about helping those sort of people that, that care for other people when it's their darkest hour. I go to bed at night and sometimes I look to my left and his face is lying next to me on the pillow. And it's a face that I look at that shows him in death, not in life, which is, you know, which is horrific, but then it is in death. So I'm not gonna spend the rest of my life thinking negative thoughts about him. He was what he was. He decided to do what he did and he'll be remembered for all those things. So why should I go down to the, you know, the depths of all those negative feelings, and I refuse to do that. Are you coming to bed, David? I'm not tired. I'll be up in a minute. Now, how, how have you been able to turn around from a real negative in your life to a real positive? I mean, walking in tonight and seeing hundreds of people, I mean, earlier on there, seeing people like Duncan Bannatyne in the audience, and, and, and Tim Healy, and, and Denise Welsh from Loose Women. Hey. You know, how, how, how do you manage to turn around from a year ago to where you are today? You know, what drives you? What, what, what's the things in your mind? What, what drives you to where you are? Um, Come to bed, David, please. I, I think what drives me on in my mind is um, I refuse to be beaten. I've always been competitive and I refuse to be beaten by such an evil thing that happened to me, by, by such an evil person. Come to bed, David. You'll have a headache in the morning. For the first time in a year, I'm not tired and I'm staying up. I've just learnt to use Twitter. I get it. I bloody get it. And you know, this evening is testament to the good side of human nature. You, you know, it, it actually feels... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It, it actually feels... I feel good about myself for looking after other people and trying to help. I mean, what more could you ask for in life? A round of applause. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Time is more o'clock. The 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 time is more o'clock. And you can fuck up an old clock. Siri, open Twitter, dictate. Thank you to every single person that came tonight. Our first golf day and gala evening was a huge success. Thank you to every single person that came tonight. Our first golf day and gala evening was a huge success. Siri, open Twitter, dictate. How brilliant were at Hayley Conway's encore dancers. Thank you for your great efforts. The performances were fantastic. How brilliant were at Hayley Conway's encore dancers. Thank you for your great efforts. The performances were fantastic. Siri Dictate. Hundreds of people across the world were affected physically, emotionally or psychologically and are even now still living with the effects of what happened in one week in July 2010. Our thoughts go out to all, as do our thanks to those who helped however they could.
especially our emergency services. R.I.P. Christopher Brown, 1981, 2010. Character count exceeded. Thank you, Siri. Open Facebook. Double tap Facebook. Siri? What does Siri mean? Siri means in Norwegian, beautiful woman who leads you to victory. Why are you called Siri? I was named after my creator's daughter. Who was your creator? My creator was Dag Kitlaus. What can I help you with? Tell me a joke. I don't really know any jokes. What do you believe? I believe that for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. Siri, do you love me? You are looking for love in all the wrong places. Siri, text wife. Which wife do you mean? Wife A or wife B? Siri, are you flirting with me? Roses are red, violets are blue. Haven't you got anything better to do? No, not really. I can't sleep. New tweet. New tweet button. Text field is editing. Dictate. Dictate. Retweet from Darren Rathband. Some people just make it even harder. Fools come in all shapes. Some people just make it even harder. Fools come in all shapes. Retweet. Dictate. Having more pellets taken out today. Dictate. Having more pellets taken out today. Alcohol next sleeping pills. Not working. Dictate. Dictate. Alcohol next. Sleeping pills not working. I can't sleep either. What? For months after the bomb went off, I couldn't sleep. Siri? Call me. Hashtag woman awake at night or um. Hashtag 77 survivor. You're kidding me, right? You're that woman. You just lost your teeth. The woman who was three feet away from Hasib Hussein when the bomb went off. Yeah. Three teeth. Shit. You should be dead. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. You've been drinking. How do you know? You posted it on Twitter. Oh, oh yeah. Don't drink. What? Don't drink. It'll make the post-traumatic stress disorder last longer if you do. How do you know? Believe me. <laughs> I know. Drink to celebrate. Nothing more. I've got a lot to celebrate. You have. I'm learning how to clock eat. What's that? That's when you imagine your plate is a clock face. You have your eggs at 12 o'clock or whatever. So you don't dip your chocolate biscuit in your ketchup. That's what I'm celebrating. Don't drink. No. I won't drink. From now on, I won't drink ever, ever, ever drink again. You are going to get better, you know. You just have to learn everything again. Everything? And then we'll have dinner? And I won't get it all down my front? Get some sleep. Message me. David? David? Did you sleep down here all night? And if I did, I'm still a man, you know. Oh, I'm not saying anything. No, I know what you're thinking, though. Yeah, you've, you've got an interview with the BBC today. You think I don't know that? <sighs> what time is it? Oh, shit. I'm struggling to deal with being blind. I, uh, I can deal with being shot. It, it happened. I, I can't change that. Yeah, I'm struggling. Peter White, presenter of Radio 4's In Touch. Y you say that you want to be able to do the things that you need to do for yourself. But does that mean that, to some extent, perhaps you are pushing away help that is being offered with the best of intentions? I've never ever turned down any help from anybody else that's offered. You know, fundamental help that I need, whether it be counselling or rehabilitation. I'm not that silly, but... Uh, well, I, I'm different to other people. Everybody's different, and... And what annoys me is people treat you as a textbook case of, oh, it must be this Dave. Nobody ever came up to me when I was shot, or, or my family, and said, you know what, you're really going to need some help. You've got an appointment in three weeks' time. They've just let me 
you know, to get on and do what I've done. I don't know whether this is my own perceptions and my insecurities, but I hear people's voices when they're talking to me. Um, I feel the resentment in their voice for having to guide me round and, you know, when I'm asking for stuff. And it, the audible, yes, what? It gets louder and more unpleasant to listen to. There's lots of things like that. Do you think, to some extent, that you're imagining that? It's a sense of your own, perhaps, frustration at it, or is that really happening? I'm sorry. You're mistaken. You couldn't have seen him with a woman yesterday. Goodbye. I don't know. I think it is happening. I think there's an element of the fact that it's my own insecurity with what I'm dealing with, you know, with, with what I'm dealing with. But, but I'm quite astute to people's um, characters and stuff. I think I always had been. But he's his own person. He can come and go as he pleases, and I don't appreciate the insinuation. Thank you. Well, maybe it was a friend. He's got a lot of new friends. So, do you see hope at the end of this, both in terms of your personal relationship and in coming to terms with what has happened? I think um, I've spoke to quite a few people over the last few months, and... Everybody tells me you've got ten years before you realise you can deal with being blind, but at the moment I can't even see the next 12 months. But, uh, well, I, I'm taking each day as it comes. I, I'm trying my best. It's tough, but, um, well, I've lasted 14 months. <laughs> there are bits that keep me going, like for the last three months it was the Great North Run, so I'll pick something else. Because I can't deal with keep concentrating on stumbling around my garden or going shopping and having to walk around with somebody's elbow. Oh, David. No. This was not part of the deal. Team Blue Lamp have completed the 2011 Virgin London Marathon. PC David Rathband and his guide, Steve White, crossed the finish line in 6 hours and 49 minutes. Just giving page, total donors 498. Total money raised, £18,541.97. 185% of total target. Donation by Andy Cockhill on the 9th of the 5th, 2011. £15. Well done, Steve and David. That was a fantastic achievement. Donation by Nuz Courtney on the 6th of the 5th, 2011. Five pounds. Just read your story in my hubby's police fed mag and wanted to give my support. Well done, guys. You do Britain proud. Dragon's Den star Duncan Bennettine, 62, took the plunge for the Blue Lamp Foundation, which PC Rathband set up after he was shot and blinded by gunman Valmo last year. PC Rathband's son, Ashley, 17, organised the event and Bannatyne was persuaded by him to join in the ebb sailing at Newcastle's Vermont Hotel. Bannatyne said he's brave like his dad. Ashley added the thought of doing it was more frightening than actually doing it, but I just kept thinking of how much more my dad went through. What, David? Are you, are you in some special club now? And don't I count anymore? Or well, what's she got that I haven't got? Siri dictate. At David Rathband, 3,016 tweets, 319 following, 11,042 followers. Sad to announce, Mrs. R has called time on our marriage. Separation permanent. Sad to announce, Mrs. R has called time on our marriage. What are you doing? Don't do this. Don't open the box. Rathband, 2,754 tweets, 605 following, 1,228 followers. With slight inaccuracy in the tweet by at PC David Rathband, he left us and refuses to come home. Hashtag the truth will out. Bloody hell. 
losing your sight is one thing. It hurts. It's confusing. It's disorienting. It knocks you, if you know what I mean. Uh, losing your independence until you've retrained how to do things, that's another thing. But losing your job and your livelihood too. I'm sure a few of us know that feeling at the moment. It's difficult. Um, often people go through a period of grief when they've lost a sense or a limb. Uh, they might not recognise it as grief. They might not realise it as grief immediately. They might never realise they've gone through a period of grief or they might never grieve at all. It doesn't happen to everybody. I did. I definitely did. But it didn't hit me until about six years after um, my accident. And it really is a life-changing experience to lose part of your senses. And some of the comments have mentioned that as well, uh, how it must have been so difficult. But for me, how I see it is, it's not just that life-changing experience. It's that on top of his PTSD, on top of being shot, and that on top of perhaps the difficulty that he had in accepting support or the lack of support in his life and his work. It's not like 10 years ago we could talk so openly about our mental health. Um, social media has a massive role to play in mental health. It releases endorphins, uh, the dopamines, but the comments and the light for people that are light perceptive, um, it has a massive hit. I wonder how PC Rathband interacted with it. Anyway, let's go to some of your comments about how you used social media. Um, let's go to the first one that I got here was from Suzanne. I used social media to communicate with friends who live abroad and who aren't local to me. Yeah, it's a, it's a sense of creating community. It's a tool. From Amy. I was a student, so I was one of the first to get onto it and use it just for fun. I tweeted mundanities mainly and used Facebook to make fun of people and have parties. Nice. Yeah, it was light-hearted. It's changed now. It's very political quite often. Um, from Louise, uh, I had a point here from Louise, where did that go? Um, let's move on to another one. Um, from Suzanne, it is quite a strange experience, I can't relate fully to it. Uh, it must be scary to, uh, to lose one's sight. Yeah, absolutely. From Pardeen, hi Robin. Not savoured lockdown after being hospitalised with the virus, recovery and now remote working. Enjoying this immersive experience, I'm glad. Uh, never embraced social media. I was captivated by the aftermath of the media coverage. I felt a connection as a visually impaired person. I'm really glad to hear that some of our visually impaired audience members feel a connection to this moment in time, this history in the UK. Quite often visual impairment is seen as well, it's not seen. It's quite often hidden and people don't see it in our society. That can be quite a difficulty. Um, from Mo. I remember my astonishment at the time, hearing how Facebook was gathering this momentum of his supporters, um, who just seemed to be coming out of the woodwork. Uh, felt like it had turned over a stone that all this muck was under. And that's only grown and grown over the last 10 years. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> interesting, especially in a few years ago when we started to understand echo chambers. Absolutely. People spout whatever they want, rightly or wrongly. Interesting. Really nice point there. Um, so we've got a few other comments here. Quite a few, actually. Um, from Hannah. I've just scrolled back through 10 years of Facebook, only to find that the only thing that happened to me in early July is that I got my first iPhone. Okay. 
Hey, that's actually a really interesting point because iPhone is one of the first smartphones um, to integrate accessibility. I don't think it happened on their very first model, but in their later models, it definitely did. Um, which is actually a really important milestone for visually impaired people. So thanks for that reminder, Hannah. Uh, Katie. Lockdown made the world smaller, showed our vulnerabilities and reliance on others as blind and visually impaired people. The same with social distancing. But there have been kindnesses and hope, and PC Rathband's despair must not be the way we feel now. Um, we have lost some or all of our independence through COVID. Thank you for that. It's a really nice perspective. Um, from Mariam. When I moved to the UK in my late 20s, for the first couple of years, which I was still in the no man's land between my old years, uh, between my old home and my new home, Facebook helped me keep in touch with my old life, memories, friends and family, and somehow with my old identity before I rebuilt it. But I guess Facebook was different back then, 10 years ago. I'm not sure if I would use it in the same way now. Interesting. I wonder what makes you think that you wouldn't use it in the same way, how you would use it now. Thanks for that. Uh, we've got quite a few more comments. Give me just a second and I'll come down to it. Um, this is really interesting, making me think about how Rathband was portrayed in the press and the public eye, as a blind superhero triumphing over tragedy. I wonder why sighted people need to see blind people as heroes, like perky Helen Keller. Oh, that is a brilliant thought. Um, this is something else that Victoria's tapped into. Uh, think the media spotlight that Rathband was in will have exasperated um, the dissonance between his in, uh, intensely personal struggles with sight loss and to having to live up to the image of being brave, a hero, etc. The personal struggle is hard enough without the media pressure. Thank you, really, thank you for that, Victoria. You bring me into my next point. So thank you for the other comments. I'm sorry I haven't read them all out. Maybe I'll get the chance to do that afterwards. But I wanted to talk about heroes. Um, about heroes and survivors and superheroes, this language that we use. Um, two years after PC Rathband and I lost our sight in 2010, it was 2012, it was the year of the Olympics and the Paralympics, and the Paralympics was presented by Channel 4. I don't know if you remember this, the adverts with the, the loud, um, fast-paced music and um, the framing of the advert was really interesting. They framed the athletes who had spent years, maybe decades, training in their sport. Um, didn't frame them as athletes, they framed them as superheroes. I'm not sure how I feel about that. There's a dissonance for me. Moat was a hero to some. Rathband was a hero to others. But what makes a hero? Do you think we deem those, um, those that we deem as heroes, sorry, uh, want to be a hero? Or do you think they actually idolise that thought and they really want to be that image? Their, ident uh, their ideology being forced into this by the media. What does that pressure do to them? Send me your thoughts on your comments. Keep sending them through. Um, again, if you want to send that comment off, uh, through about your thoughts on heroes and superheroes and that pressure, and especially what that did to David Rathband, and then you can press Control and uh, sorry, Alt and H and uh, Command Shift and H. Enough from me. Over to Matthew. Two thousand and ten saw one of the biggest manhunts in British police history. It took place in and around Newcastle, a proud and tough shipbuilding city in the northeast of England. The hunt was for just one man, Raoul Thomas Moat. I'm going to give you a chance because I am hunting for officers right now. But this isn't his story. This is the story of the traffic policeman he shot and blinded, Police Constable David Rathband. Hollywood. Hollywood 
when David left his wife Kath, he went straight to stay with his sister and soon traveled to Australia to visit his twin brother Darren. He'd been planning to go for a long time with his family, but now he was going alone. He used Twitter to keep in contact with the outside world. At Big Bell Bess, you who over there, hope you're enjoying that lovely sunshine, David, and that all is well with you. At Dancing Boots, have a fab time there. Certainly is way too chilly here to get your body out. But if you feel the need, winky smiley face. At Gaza Official, find me on Twitter. We'll keep you, get everyone up to date. Looking forward to getting to know you guys and showing you the real Gaza. So we're now, we're experienced, we're developing new forms of narrative, new forms of storytelling that are less dependent on a satisfying ending and more dependent on a satisfying continuation. So where you and I grew up with board games that you, you start and someone wins, right? You play the game in order to win more progressive, more interesting forms of play are like fantasy role-playing games where kids come back week after week after week and play the same scenario of Dungeons and Dragons. So the object of the game is not to win because winning ends the play. The object of the game is how creative can we be to keep this game going, this story moving. Right? The satisfaction doesn't come from getting to the end and heaving that sigh of relief. The satisfaction comes along the way by making lots and lots of connections. Oh, she sends me to my room for something daft. You know, I don't remember what it was. She walks the back of my legs with a stick on the way up the stairs, and I'm mad. I'm, I'm crying, and I lie on my bed. I must have just conked out, because I wake up a couple of hours later on my bed, and I feel peaceful again. And I go out the window, and it's still bright, and I'm trying to work out if she's still mad at me, and I can see that she's doing a bonfire, you know, the grass is up to her knees, there's thick black smoke drifting over the fences of all the back gardens, I think it looks like clouds of black horse doing the Grand National, I can see bits of ash floating down everywhere and landing on next door's washing, my bedroom feels odd too, but sometimes it's like that, when you just wake up, and I go downstairs in the kitchen and I get a glass of water, I open the back kitchen door and I shout, Mum, she pods about the fire with a stick, I just want to see what she's burning, I rush into the garden and get it back, but she grabs me and I charge her legs and I grab the stick and I shout at her. She's burning my Star Wars sleeping bag. It's melting and on fire and dripping. And then I see she's burning everything. Stretch Armstrong, Evil Knievel, the Fonz that did a thumbs up. You hag. You hag, you stupid, stupid hag. The night you showed me the year 69 wasn't the first time we'd met, wasn't David? We'd met before, hadn't we? I was going straight. You shot me, Raoul. I was going straight, though. But when I pulled you over, you didn't have the right insurance for transporting commercial metal, did you, Raoul? You shouldn't have been moving that scaffolding, should you? First time I saw you, I knew you were a job. The moment I saw you, I knew you were evil. I was straight for five years. Most people don't count the years. You bastards never left me alone for five minutes. Well, you certainly sorted that out, didn't you? Now I don't leave you alone, do I? You'll fade. Silly dictate. It takes more energy to remain a victim and less energy to become a survivor. Why do people choose to be a victim? Siri dictate. It takes more energy to remain a victim and less energy to become a survivor. Why do people choose to be a victim? I'm not a victim. I'm a proper complicated post-traumatic stress me. I'm a new chemical pathway in your brain. I am. I'm the robe on your next journey, I'm still. I'll recover. His wife rebuilt him. Then he kicked down the building. Now there's only scaffolding. You can get two grand a ton for steel. Think what you'll get for a copper. And now the end is near, and so we face the final curtain. <laughs> you threw a chair at her, and it he hit your daughter in the face. Oh, big man. How could your girlfriend leave someone as, as talented as you, Raoul? You were a true innovator. You got 20,000 Facebook followers over a weekend. You were the biggest show on TV for a weekend. You're nothing. You ordered a shotgun from your cell, like you were the centre of the world. Any teenager can do that. And then, when you got out, what did you do? You went inviting people to be guests on your show by shooting them. Without an audience, David, this is just nothing. 
but with an audience. Without exemption. City dictate. Sad to announce, Mrs. R has called time on our marriage. Separation permanent. Siri dictate. Sad to announce, Mrs. R has called time on our marriage. Separation permanent. We're fish and chips. Batman and Robin. Tom and Jerry. It's me and him. Rathbund and Mort. We've been twinned. Melted together. He's PC David Rathband, and don't you ever forget it. He's not a policeman anymore. He goes round and round. Stop. Siri. Yes? I'm an idiot. No, you're not. Would you like to see if I can find some local idiots? No. I had to see if I was still a man. It is so dark being me. And I'm sorry, but she, she was lovely. And she had already crossed the sea. She had been in the darkness. It helped me. I had to see what he hadn't taken. He hadn't taken me. Would you like me to find plans about building boats at sea? I made my family break. Would you like me to find family breaks? We're still here. You're always welcome, anytime. My face hurts every day. My face hurts. Would you like me to find out about the newest painkillers? City text. I'm sorry, Cuff. I want us to be together, our team. You and I. Oh, I'm an idiot. This is hard to do by text. My life is you, babe. Kiss, 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 kiss. There is no reply. Oh, it just goes round and round and round and round. Would you like me to tell you about PTSD? PTSD is the first mental health issue to be fully understood by science. No, Siri. Science doesn't understand. Siri dictate. Always the case. There are either too many steps forward or too many people behind with daggers to throw. At Big Bell Bess. Afraid, David, I have gone through life with little daggers, but sadly you've got the one big B, five asterisks, D. So, you all ready for tomorrow? <laughs> Darren, you need to listen to what I've got to say. Sure, okay. I need you to promise me certain things as my twin. Now, David, stop. Please don't shout at me for what I'm going to ask. If the wheels... David... I need you to be quiet and listen to what I say. If the wheels fall off... At Big Bell Bess. Happy to see you've enjoyed Australia Day, David. Hope you sleep well. Think of us here in this miserable pouring rain, ha ha. At Northburn. It sounds like you're having a great time down under. Delighted for you, smiley face. Hashtag enjoy. Thank you, Darren. You know what to do. You've been very good to me. I used to think that I just like catching bad men. That's why I was there that night. And I was just vain. I wanted to be the one to bring in Raoul Notes. But then sometimes I wonder whether I was there because of our mother. I mean... I didn't have to be a copper, did I? Could have been something else. I couldn't do anything right. She blamed me for everything. Why? I don't know. I had to sort out right from wrong myself. Be a copper. She gave me no choice. We wanted to be a copper. I did. You know, I never finished my final shift. I'm still technically on duty. You're still a copper. <laughs> Must be why I feel so knackered. Siri dictate. Well, it's time to sleep. My loyal friend Tamazepan is staying with me. Z Z Z Z Z. Said no phone calls today. Perhaps tomorrow. I don't think I'm built for a desk job. And sometimes, Darren. I think that I was there that night because of fate. 
that it was my destiny. But then I think that your destiny is something that is only true after you're dead, so it can't be that. But then I think it must be. No. The real reason I was on the A69 that night was far more simple. It wasn't my mother, it wasn't fate. It was something far more simple. City dictate. To promise is an offer of integrity. To break a promise is the lowest form of selfishness. I'll tell you what happened, Darren. I know what happened. You've told me. They didn't pass on Raoul Mort's message in time. They were listening to it back at the Lane police station when, when they should have been warning the effing bobbies out on the effing beat. An apology, Darren, an apology. Because I've thought a lot about this. With an official police apology, I'll be able to cope with what happened. I know I will. I'm sorry, David. The anger of being in darkness forever. Just get Northumbria police to say I should never have been there. The whole manhunt, it was a circus. It was cock up after cock up. The anger of losing your job. I listen to every word on Sky News, and I know I listen to every word because Kath read me the credit card bill for hospital TV when I go home. 42 quid for seven days to watch telly in hospital to listen to my own story. The anger of never driving a car again of never seeing the beauty of your children's faces again. I even remember them debating whether to warn the contestants in the Big Brother house 200 miles away that Raoul was on the loose, like he was going to climb over the walls and hide there. It had a life of its own. They had tornadoes flying low. You had Ray Mears turn up in Rothbury, sniffing droppings and trying to track down moats over the moors. Ray Mears! Who made that decision? The anger of fragments of metal in your face that sting like bees. The anger of not being able to see the food on your plate. Siri dictate to at Kath Rathband. Thank you for your correspondence this weekend. You've kept my spirit so high with your compelling compassion. The anger of knowing that you've screwed up the relationship with the woman who put you back together. Right, the fact of the matter is, I'm not coming in alive. You, you have hassled me for so many years. If you come anywhere near me, I'll kill you. I've got two hostages at the moment, right? Come anywhere near me and I'll kill them as well. I I'm coming to get you. I'm not on the run. I'm coming to get you. You have made me unwell. You have made me do this because you just won't leave me out. How many times did they listen to it before they thought of warning me? David, don't. How many times? Oh, they were all playing at being CSI detectives. What did they think? Did they think they could discern the species of birds tweeting in the background, trying to locate what bit of forest he was in? Why are you protecting them? I'm not. Then he rang up again. After he shot me, how many times did they listen to that? I was bleeding to death. The anger of darkness forever. The anger of being betrayed by your husband. What do you do with the anger of losing control? Are you taking me serious now? I have just downed your officer. You're gonna to have to kill me because I am never gonna stop. The public has nothing to fear from me, but the police do. You've been let down. You're right, I've been let down. I should be dead by all accounts, but I'm not, I'm here. They promised me a man outside my door. He came after two days. The biggest manhunt in British history. They loved it. All of them loved it. The dignity of an apology, Darren. The dignity of an apology. You know what to do, Darren. If the wheels really do fall off. The anger of once having been the best footballer in the country. The anger of not being able to stop drinking. The anger of going to prison. The anger of never having a father. The anger of having all your toys burned in front of you as a child. At Jimmy White, MBE 147. I'm good, thanks, David. Anytime, you're welcome. That trophy better be polished. At Brett Kinsella, MBE. Hi, David. We're as well as can be, thank you. Hope you are too. And don't worry, I'm only joking. I'm not that bad. <laughs> Spidey face. At Team Denise Welsh, dancing on ice contestant and stroke funny women presenter. Any chance of a retweet, David? Hashtag Denise to win. 090161. I'm Duncan Valentine. The stranger. I'm not spoken for a No are you? What do you do with the anger? What do you do?
We came into this world together. I promise you we will go out together. Promise me you won't do anything stupid, David. I can't promise you that. David. Nah, don't worry. I'm not going to do anything. Can you make us a cup of tea? I've rearranged the fragments of this story so many times now, trying to find the answers. I've rearranged the fragments so many times that I don't just see David. I see men. I see footballers, plumbers, lawyers. I see people like me. I see men going to extraordinary lengths to protect and provide for their families. I see men losing their status and not knowing what to do. Suicide isn't lonely men, or shameful men. It isn't the quiet type or the loners. It's just men. And here, it's the biggest killer of men under the age of 45. Siri Dictate. Back to the land of Twitter. And a few more on the list let me down. No surprises there. Had good day, all dark. Siri Dictate. A busy day. Another 40 pieces of shrapnel removed from my face. Another six hours of work. However, it's getting better. Siri dictate. Another few hours removing pieces of shit from my face. 58 today. Siri. A meeting with social services on Thursday. Something to look forward to. I wonder if I'll get a painted doorstep. Siri, Mrs. R said no to getting back. Disaster. So, job lost, eyes lost, family lost, wife and marriage lost. What a year. Add danger, Scouse. Things will change between you and your family in time. You just have to wait a bit. Trust me. Enjoy your barbecue. Smiley face. At Metamos. David, please talk to someone close to you. You're feeling like you're at the bottom right now, but I know you can spring back. At Metamos, at David Rathband, my heart goes out to you. My other half was disabled through the job. He too lost his wife who left him while in rehab. Now he's got me. Siri Dictate. February the 24th, 5.10 p.m. R.I.P. P.C. Rathband. At Metamos, at David Rathband, there's something I know, David. Your number's not up yet. You have many, many people who care for you. Granted, we can't replace the past. At Loch Lomondon. Hope the police will look after it, David Rathband. He's obviously on the edge. Reading his recent timeline is awful. At Mummy Barrow. Anybody know at David Rathband personally? Worrying tweets, sir. At Phil J. Baker. At David Rathband. You desperately need help to get through this, David. Don't try alone. There's people who can help. You can do it, my friend. Phil. Siri Dictate. February the 25th. I have behaved terribly towards my wife since I got shot. And she has done all that she can to support me. At David Cox. No one knows how you feel being through what you have. It's bound to change a person. You have angry moments and do the wrong thing. Siri Dictate. Very emotional few days, but back on track. Now focusing on my trip back to the UK and the road ahead. At Metamose, at David Rathband, if you need some R&R, &R, you can always come out here to the beach. Northern Mozambique is different. Beer's cold, sun's warm. Siri Dictate, thank you for your positive comments. I'm trying my best. Sometimes I get it wrong. Sorry.
The late hero PC David Rathband would have been very proud for his daughter to carry the Olympic torch today, his widow has said. The blinded traffic officer, who'd been shot by gunman Raoul Mote, was selected to run a leg with the flame, but was found hanged at his home in Blythe, Northumberland, in February. His daughter Mia, who wore a blindfold, was handed the flame in Whitburn, South Tyneside, on the gates head to Durham leg of its tour around Britain. The 43-year-old officer's widow, Kath, said... It means so much to Mia and to the family that she's been given this opportunity to carry the Olympic torch in her dad's place. He would have been very proud. Thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, for the live streamed presentation of the audio drama Rathband. This event has been sponsored by Extant, which is the leading professional visually impaired performing arts company in the UK. If you've enjoyed this event, then please consider donating via Extant's website, extant.org.uk. All contributions will go towards supporting the development and employment of visually impaired people in the theatre industry. We can also continue the conversation after this Zoom meeting online on social media. And you can contact Extant with the handle at Extant LTD. That's across all three social medias of Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at Extant LTD. Thank you very much. Um, before we start our question and answer, I just want to go back to a few of our comments that we had um, through this. Uh, through the last uh, act. So I'm going to go for um, one of them from Hannah. I was angry um, when he killed himself because I was worried that it reinforced the blindness is a fate worse than death myth. But then it was the sighted world's vision of blindness that he was having to deal with. That's a really interesting point. Uh, myself included, going from being sighted to visually impaired. That has a real knock on your ideology of the world. And dealing with that, that's tricky. Thank you very much for that, Hannah. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Kieran. Let me just find Kieran's comment. Um, there's so many comments, I'm just sifting through. Thank you very much for bearing with. Kieran, a hero is someone who achieves something relatable, whereas a superhero achieves something unattainable. That is really fascinating. Thank you for that. Uh, so going back to this question of hero and superhero. Yeah, uh, Suzanne, um, they've also written, calling them heroes could be perceived as patronising. A lot of people have disabilities. We should be treated with equal respect as individuals, perhaps. Yeah, that's a really nice thought. Um, there's a, a thought here from Stephen. Portraying disabled people as superhuman isn't much better than portraying them as subhuman. And that ties in really nicely what, to what you were saying, Suzanne. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I love that thought. And this is, um, it's something so interesting that we have around language and how uh, difficult it is to just label one person one thing. Um, this is from Amelia and Al. Being a superhuman can erase the details and nuance of a disabled person's life. I would argue anybody's life. Uh, that's me putting in. Back to Amelia now. Someone mentioned Helen Keller earlier. Um, she was instrumental in setting up legislation that protected blind people in the USA and in lots of other parts of the world. She was a political dignitary, a radical activist and a racist. She was an actual human with complexities, but people remember her as the cute kid who learned how to say the word water one day. Um, that's what makes her amazing according to history. Also, her teacher, Anne Sullivan, was visually impaired. No one seems to talk about that. Yeah, that is fantastic. You kind of really articulated everything I've ever thought about that and how nuanced we all are. We are more than just one label, more than one little box. We're human. We're all human. And that's a really tricky thing to, to explore. Um... And this is from Katie. I know someone who is uh, doing so many wonderful things having lost his sight. Not everyone will feel the same way as PC Rathband, but he was an amazing person for being prepared to work as a police officer with the risks he faced. Yeah, 
Nice. Thank you for that, Katie. Um, so I'm going to welcome to our Zoom um, Maria Oshodi, who is the Artistic Director of Extant, and Christopher Hogg as well. So just give me a second. I will um, open their videos for you. Bear with. Technology is a fun one. Uh, so... Hello, Maria. Hiya. <laughs> and hello, Christopher. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Oh, hi. Thank you so much for this amazing evening. Thank you. I'm just speechless. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Christopher Hogg is the writer of the play Rough Band, the audio drama Rough Band. And Christopher, I do actually want to start with you. Um, at the very uh, last act there, we start to hear more about the wider implications of social media and the trauma, the PTSD of um, the PC Rathbun is experiencing. And I want to ask why this piece was so important to you um, and why this man's story was so important to you, especially in relation to Calm, which is one of the sponsors of the project. And Calm is a campaign against living miserably. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I had to go, I was, there was a big debate in me when I was writing it, whether to include myself or whether it was just, you know, just, whether it was just too many stories and it was taken away from David's story. But I felt as, as a man that I needed permission to tell the story of someone who was struggling. Um, and in, in many ways, this, the, 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 the whole scenes between Kath and him, those are actually the scenes that happened between my wife and me when I was going through some of those worst moments. So there's a real blend of my personal life and my experience trying to trying to imagine what was happening to David during those times, especially after he'd left the hospital for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, my experience of mental health is that having grown up in with years of domestic violence, um, my I'm just wired for fear. Um, and so I think that what fear does is it releases loads of kind of cortisone and stress in your system and so I often feel really fragmented um, and so for me writing putting together this story you know putting something outside of myself onto a bit of paper is a way of me making kind of sense of the world as uh, as I experience it um, uh, I obviously I think that what comes out at the end in the in the play is that I don't think David killed himself because of the blindness i think he needed the dignity of an apology which he never he never received um i think that um he was in masses amounts of pain um and uh i think that i think he was under a, a misapprehension that it would take a decade to get better um and also i think that he was immensely proud and so to go back to the campaign against living miserably um i think that what you understand from working with them is that most men are about five bad decisions away from doing something terrible um and you know you take away their job their house their sense of independence and then everybody gets to where david is it's not you know visual impairment isn't 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 it's just what was just one of those 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 things um and i think that uh, I think that, that I, what I wanted was, I, what, I'm, what I wanted was for people to, um, in, in the world of social media, there's so much noise. I felt so delighted that there are so many people here tonight just listening deeply to someone's story. And I think that that's almost the antidote to the, to the world of social media where there is so much noise and we live in such an attention led economy is, you know, it's, it's a radical act to listen deeply. I mean, if you listen deeply, you can be changed. And so mm -hmm. it was for me having it as an a, an acoustic piece was very important. I, I'm rambling now, so I'm going to hand over to to somebody else. No, thank you. You bring me um, quite rightly onto Maria, and I want to ask you in terms of this being an audio piece um, as a, a blind artist. I want to ask: Do you remember? these um, moments in history? Do you remember PC Rathband's um, experiences and how that was portrayed in the media? And what did that 
have an effect on you? How how did that affect you? But also, um, I want to know your thoughts on this as an audio piece, and uh, yeah, what you think of it in that respect. Well, um, okay, uh, I'll take the first first question first. Um, <laughs> that that I think that. Um, you know, it's, I think what Chris has done is really interesting. It, what I feel that he's done throughout the whole of the, the, the piece that he's created around Rap Band is just create a massive provocation for us as, as a listener and as a reader of the script um, about um, all, all the different things that he's, he's, he's mentioned there around masculinity and around, um, you know, um, the acquiring of impairment, about um, the, um, the way that the, the the external world processes that and reflects that back onto you, how you deal with that. So I think that's that, that that's all really interesting. But in terms of my personal um, recollections at the time, I mean, you know, I do remember it as you know, often you know things happen in um, in the news that we uh, depends what depending on what's going on in our lives, um, we take on in uh, to, uh, to, to, to sort of different degrees, and at the time. Uh, it was very much something that captivated my attention in the news. Um, and I was, uh, I, I was the person who made the comments about being astonished about the way that Facebook was gaining this momentum, this traction around um, um, interference in the, um, the whole saga at the time, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Um, so that was the first thing. And then after that, you know, bit by bit, you know, there was this, um, um, celebrity sort of personification of David Rathbam and um, he would, you know, I'd hear about him here and there. I didn't necessarily follow him or anything, but um, I do remember him being interviewed by Peter White on, on BBC Radio 4. One of the um, experiences that um, Chris has outlined in the drama. And um, I remember listening to him, hearing him talk and feeling that the way that he was presenting uh, his um, his experience of, of his visual impairment um, and the trauma and the process of his recovery just didn't feel like it ran as being really authentic to me. It felt like there was um, a mask um, that I was hearing, <laughs> mm. a mask, as so I felt like I was hearing a mask. Um, and this so is... I, yeah. Sorry, this is something really fascinating that um, that Peter White almost mentioned as well. Um, the BBC Radio Four uh, presenter. And, you were interviewed by him yesterday, weren't you? Yeah, and th that's going out um, live tonight. And this is something that he also felt um, at the time. Um, yeah. So it's interesting yeah. that you both pick well, quite a few people yeah. that you picked up on. I did, I did. And so, um, you know, what struck me um, was it felt like there was something that was slightly false or put, to get, put together to mm. create this, as, you know, this, this face um, that he was presenting and it didn't feel real. Um, and I didn't know whether that came from, you know, what that came from, like I say, because it wasn't really taking much of an interest. And I think this uh, falls into something that ties both up that perspective and also the the idea of masculinity perhaps and northern pride especially as someone who comes from the northeast that it plays a massive um, effect in your mental health and how you support yourself how you support your family you cannot rely on anybody else you have to do that and you have to do that yourself when you are put in that position to ask for support it's really really difficult um, yeah so I was just, I was just really want to, just want to say when I was listening to that, especially the third act there, mm. kind of um, you know, and Chris talking about these these sort of these five degrees of being away from doing something, you know, um, regrettable, um, about sort of that that would affect anybody. I think you know, what is it specifically about being a man that makes that. Um, potentially more acute because you know like I think link think about you know one you know the responsibility that you have I guess around you know he made definitely choices 
I, I, I'd like to come in because I think that the, yeah. the, the choice a man has about his anger, and this is what I was trying to get into the drama, was that Ral Moat sends his anger outwards. David, David Rathbun takes his anger inwards. And it's almost like we're, we're born differently. So, you know, we, it's not that we make a choice. It's just that we find one more easy than the other. And I, so I think that the, the, the final layer that gets taken off a man is when they can no longer care for their family because then that's something that they've been told is their job uh, from an early age. And when that gets removed, then you are in very, very vulnerable territory indeed. Um, but I think that his suicide, I, I, I've had the experience of, 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 of having had a friend who, who took their life and you, everybody in the congregation was angry in a way. And it, it, and it was like, maybe to some extent, all the anger that was in that person who took their life um, ends up being transferred to the people in, in the congregation. So what people do with their anger is such an important question in this day and age. Mm. Do you know whether he, um, that David Rathburn had any um, post-traumatic counselling or therapy or anything like that, do you know, in your, the research that you did? I think it was coming. That's all I have. Right. And I think that when he had the when he had the affair with Sarah French, um, who was the survivor of the seven seven bombings, I think that that kind of took the place of, to some extent, you know, that 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 level of attachment with somebody who'd already kind of crossed the to that part of the, you know, had crossed the bridge to a, a sense of recovery was 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 important to him. It it gave him some control. I mean, he had to learn everything again, including sadly for his wife being a man. Mm. Um, thank you very much for those uh, thoughts and comments uh, and I'd just like to open it up here now um, to everybody at home, to the audience. Um, so we can do this two ways. Feel free to type in your comments into the chat and if you would like to ask your comment with audio and with video then um, just ask for the access and we will uh, grant that to you. Uh, so you can ask that with the audio and with the video as well, if you'd like. Any questions from our audience? We have so many lovely comments coming through <laughs> earlier. And now you're silent? I don't believe that. Hello. Hello. Um, my name's Katie, and I just wanted to ask um, how you made the drama, and maybe just a bit about um the kind of all of the the different kind of effects he used in it because it was really clever the way you made the, the social media and some of his inner thoughts and everything kind of it really felt on headphones like it, you were really in your head looking reading it and thinking those things um yeah thank you for that question katie um i think sound is obviously you know in the most immersive of all the kind of uh, kind of ways that you can tell a story because you're very much at the centre. Um, the, the sound design was done by a guy called John Wakefield and the direction was by uh, Jeremy Mortimer who had 35 years of BBC experience. But the way that we made it with, was with him, um, we, we failed to get it on at any theatre. There's a stage version of this which, you know, we're quite hopeful maybe one day might see the light of day. But, for, but I, I couldn't get it on and I, wasn't, I didn't have much of a profile as a writer and so um, it was actually the Arts Council who've been quite amazing over the last few months who gave us uh, £8,550 and so that obviously I did a bit of crowdfunding as well um, and so together we had about 12 grand to put it all together and um, the cast had been with it for quite a long time and um, there's lots of doubling up going on everywhere. I mean, we've got, you know, to have all of those different voices, we needed to have a, a cast that could be versatile. And so you'll find that Ralmote and Gaza, if you delve too, if you delve, delve deep, <laughs> are the same person, but um, hopefully they, it, didn't, it didn't detract from your experience. Um, I'm very happy to share, you know, um, there is a website called rathbandplay.com where we go more deeply into how it was made and tips for making audio drama. And also, just to mention that Gerard McDermott is a oh actor who played um, PC Rathbun. Yes, and Gerard McDermott, he, he was someone who had become visually impaired in his life as well. 
um, and that was an important part of the, of the process was to try and, and you know, respect the, the, the differing views that happen in the world of impairment and, and having an actor that had gone through that process gave the, gave the piece of depth that it wouldn't have had. Um, I've got a, thank you very much for that. I've got a question here from Amelia before I go to Andrew, I see your hand. Um, Amelia, uh, can either of you talk about the use of Siri's voice? It was so interesting to hear how she became different things. I see you again, Chris, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Siri does weirdly mean beautiful woman that will lead you to victory. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Or not, or not. Um, and I'm really interested in how, as a writer, because um, I came, I was in tech for many years and then I started writing plays. Um, and so as a writer, I'm really interested in how we represent technology um, on, you know, on a stage or in an audio piece. And so I try to humanize every single piece of technology. So all the, all the accessibility settings, they all come to life with the use of actors and so I wanted to, I think that we're living in a world where as technology becomes more important, we actually look out for the more human thing. If you want to know what, what, what makes us pause our thumb on a timeline on a phone, it's when we hear or we see something that reminds us what it is to be human. Thanks for that. That's, <laughs> that's incredible. Um, I'm going to come over to you, Andrew. Oh, you are unmuted by the Alert, audio now unmuted. Hello, it's not a question. Hello. Um, you've got both of us, but may, may I answer? Um, we know exactly, um, in so many ways, how um, David was feeling because Sarah's been singing, well, it, it would have been more than seven, 17 years now if it wasn't for lockdown. He was performing around the local clubs and bars for 20 hours a week, and in two phone calls, nothing. And the loss of those places where you perform, and then gradually the gaining of a little bit more independence uh, as they start to lift the restrictions. And then suddenly we got to wear masks. So they, they give it in one hand, they take it away with another, they, they give mixed messages, and you don't know where you are. And all I want to do is to try to get Sarah performing again, but there's nowhere open to do it. And mentally, it's just such a struggle. It's just a struggle for anybody in lockdown, but for, I think for us as blind, pe as blind people, it really is like prison. We, we, we've also said that we feel that prisoners get treated better. And, mm. and that's how he must have felt. Thank you, Andrew and Sarah. Yeah. Um, there's been a couple of comments through about um, people with disabilities and also visually impaired people and their experience during lockdown. And it is, it, it is really difficult, this um, situation that we're in. Um, that freedom, that liberty, that experience to, to go out and feel safe. And even the lack of feeling safe at home because we are we've been cooped up uh, some of us may be shielding and being um here for quite a while it's uh, a difficult it's a, a rock and a hard place absolutely so thank you for sharing your thoughts there thank, thank you it was a great it was a great play and i think radio forward um, would be very impressed now unmuted <laughs> Well, I, I, it was too controversial for Radio 4, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a shame because... Uh, yeah. Oh, iPhone is going to need it. Hello, iPhone. Where's your <laughs> owner? Hello, iPhone. Where's your owner? Okay, so... Yeah. You... Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to go to our uh, next question. Um, we had... Uh, this was a, quite a few um, questions in this from Stephen. Uh, Thanks for a great play. I wondered how David's wife and family coped after his death. Uh, were they traumatised and did they face any unpleasantness? Also, the coverage of David's affair was not tackled directly, um, only its aftermath. Why was that? Um, because you're here, um, one of the things that I found out in my research, which never ever came out in the news and you will never 
hear about it anywhere else, was that I think that David and his wife had split up before the events of the shooting. Um, and they came together very much as a couple again after he'd been shot. And so to some extent, their relationship was always um, problematic. Um, one of the, th that, that didn't make it into the play. Um, in, I, I, I wrote to Kath Rathband and I wrote to Darren Rathband and um, I think that uh, I, I asked Darren if he was interested in coming along this evening, but he just said it, he didn't quite, it wasn't quite the right place for him because it is the, around the 10th anniversary of, of his death. But I think have, ethic, thinking ethically about this play has, been, has, has gone right the way through it. So um, I was oblique about his affair because I didn't want to go, I mean, if, if you like the things that you'd find out. So for example, when he went to Australia, David, left his wife in departures and then met his lover in uh, airside, you know? So, I mean, you can, it was an ethical decision about what line to take in terms of his affair. I think when writing a character, I often try and make my good characters bad and my bad characters good because people are complicated, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to make it too complicated or to hurt the people involved. Mm -hmm. And so you'll find that there, are, there were references to children, to his kids, they were removed apart from the final one about his daughter. And I think his daughter spoke recently about, um, yeah, his daughter spoke recently about, uh, about that, that, that time when she ran with a torch recently. Mm. Look that up online. For a documentary with ITV, which was aired last week. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. I'm going to go next to Kieran. I'm going to unmute you. Sorry, Kieran. Two secs. You should be able to. Press... I have to say, I'm I'm really challenged by Zoom still. Um, <laughs> I I um I absolutely recollect it totally, and it's really interesting hearing your voice, Robin, because it brings you back to the northeast a lot. And I was going to go to a friend's wedding, and it was really near the area where it was all happening. Um, so for me, uh, I recollect all of that, but I also kind of recollect the feelings, and I, I really love the way you did the play Chris because I, I recollect the feelings of what you go through in terms of whether you've lost your sight or whether you're gradually losing your sight other people's reactions to that um and as well as your reactions to it um and the expectations or your lack of expectations and all of that complexity and I I, I too really did like the gray areas and and I I felt I was really delighted that you didn't do the, you know, when eventually he did shot himself, shot himself or he was killed himself, but you didn't actually show that. You kind of indicated it. And I think that's a lot more powerful because it kind of says a lot about how to deal with mental health. And I think we as visually impaired people, particularly down during lockdown, but I think for other occasions, we um, suffer from, um, mental health quite a bit because of the pressures and the expectations that the world has on us and we have on ourselves sometimes and I think that was really amazingly put and I really like the soundscape as well but yeah very powerful story. Thank you so much I really do you know what I mean it's so as a writer it's wonderful having that chemical reaction between something you sweated over for two or three years and people who have gone through a deep act of listening to it. So thank you very much. And I think we're gonna to go to our final question of the evening. This is uh, from Katie. I'm just gonna unmute you here, Katie. Hi, sorry, I just wanted to respond on what Kieran said. I think it's Kieran just now about expectations. I think it's, it's totally right. And I wanted to say that I remember on the Peter White in Touch interview, um, David focused quite a lot on um, being kind of expected to sit in his chair and read audio books and watch television and the things that he was being offered as somebody who was blind was nothing of relevance to his previous life. Um, and, I, and I think that, I think he kind of alluded to it in the play. Um, but it, yeah, it was, it's just a really good point that expectations of vision impaired people and what he actually wanted to do, you know, it's not like you always know how to find it and it's not just all on offer for you when, when you lose your sight. Mm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I, and I don't know as well, he seemed very isolated in the story. I know that he did have connections with visually impaired people, but I kind of wonder how, how much 
he valued really what that that um, community could bring to his life um, as well. I, I, I kind of never really got a sense of that, that, that he viewed that as a, something of parity with what he had lost. And I think that's a kind of a, a transition, a jump that you want, you know, an, individuals need, need to make possibly um, to kind of reassess value. Um, so just a comment. Mm, thank you. Um, I lied when I said one last question. Uh, <laughs> we, I think we have one last one from Jill. Oh, oh you caught me out. <laughs> okay, let me just clip my wits again. <laughs> um, I'm partially sighted, so I come from that. Um, angle and I'm elderly and I lost my sight four years ago and that's a whole load of problems in itself and this this to me young man lost his sight when he was young he had life to look forward to and I've got not much life to look forward to but that I just that's a comment but the other one I wanted to make is as a historian Christopher um, I, uh, my, my mother came from the Northeast and I really do understand that concept of masculinity. I think there was a, a, a rubbish book written, Have the Men Eaten, which kind of summed up that culture, Have the Men Eaten. And my, my grandfather uh, worked in the mines until 65. Can you just imagine he was half starved and had to hew out all that coal and stuff. So that that kind of i understand the concept how strong it was and the other thing i wanted um the domestic abuse goes along with that definition of masculinity i think and um also bad childhood mm. bad childhood and this is a moment of change i think a huge change we're, we're examining so much at this moment in time we're talking a lot about female um, up, I'm, I'm obviously up for that, um, and child and children and everything. But we are forgetting the men as well. It, it's interesting you say that. For me, I feel like um, feminism is a tool to be applied to men and women and non-binary people. And for me, feminism is something that, if taught to young men at a young age uh to to young males then we may not have this difficulty in being able to speak about mental health we may not have this dominant ideology of men have to provide mm -hmm. and it, it's a real difficulty in that shift i think and especially in the northeast as well for me personally Mm, that's a really interesting comment. I think that's a great idea. Um, I think that a lot of these, um, these, these sort of political provocations at the moment, which seems that they're couched in a particular identity, are also relevant, you know, out across the board, like you're saying. And it's really that they just get, they get labelled in one way and everyone gets, they, they get seen as belonging over there and not mm. really. But I think that they, they are really, way, they're just um, um, critical kind of, discourse kind of tools that can be used if they were not so if there wasn't so much emotion around it all to actually help all of us kind of free ourselves up for particular <laughs> <laughs> so well that's well said thank you Robin um and it is 9 30 um so okay. this concludes uh, <laughs> this evening's live uh, performance and uh, live broadcast of Wrath Band. Thank you everybody for joining us, uh, to Christopher Hogg for the writing and the cast and crew which you can find at wrathbandplay.com to everybody at, at Extant, Maria, um, Rianne and Amelia for this evening and uh, thank you for all of you for joining and for all the comments. Um, if you do want to keep the conversation going, that's at Extant LTD on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Take care. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> <laughs>